don't need that information in my head. Let's, uh, let's, let's dip in. Um, welcome to In the Now with Jim Swilly, and uh, we're um, talking about a lot of things uh, that I think are interesting. We're, we're all having a good time uh, at this table. Um, what I want to talk about uh, today is, um, I don't know if any of you read uh, Charles Dickens' classic, A Tale of Two Cities. I didn't. I got the cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> Do they still sell those cliff notes? Oh, yeah. It's called But, um, but the, um, <laughs> the opening line, f very famous line in that book, uh, it's about the French Revolution, but in the opening line it says, it was the best of times, comma, it was the worst of times. Um, I, I want to sort of explore that topic a little bit, and I want you to maybe be even a little more candid than you've been in previous episodes about your own life, but um, on the day of Pentecost, after the whole deal happened with the upper room, Peter gets up to preach, and he rebukes the people. He, he talks, like he's chastising them for crucifying Jesus. He says, uh, uh, you took an innocent man, and you executed him. And in the very next breath, he says, and it was exactly as the Father had planned. Yeah. So he's really talking about what in quantum physics they, they call uh, parallel realities, mm -hmm. parallel universes. How can, the, how can you be rebuking people for something that you're saying was the will of God? So the question is, and I want to pose it, don't say what you think you should say, say what you really believe. Is it possible that the worst thing that ever happened to you mm. is yeah. actually the best thing that ever happened to you? Mm. And... Um, you know, can you get your arms around that? And what does that mean? If the worst thing that ever happened to you really was the worst thing, does it scar you? I mean, you don't, you're not, you just don't walk away from it and say, la, 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 that, you know, that's past. I mean, we live in a very real world, and I'm very much about, uh, you know, being authentic. Mm -hmm. But in big picture, if you can pan the camera back and look at the entirety of your life, is the worst thing the best thing? Or if you've just recently been through something that you think is the worst thing, is there enough time between the happening of that to where you are now for you to really have perspective on it? Well, I think definitely fire produces gold, and sometimes things are painful, but it ultimately makes you who you are. But more specifically for me, you know, when you came out, that was all over CNN. It was on People Magazine. It was everywhere. And that was a difficult uh, transition, not because of you your truth but your mother and I but got just, a divorce yeah a whole lot of different transitions right. uh, took place but you know although we had doors closed in our face God's been knocking down walls with that um without that I am a youth pastor who does music who's I would consider an interesting guy but with it now all of a sudden it's this interesting twist to the story now we've got you know, all different types of production companies. I won't even name four different major networks. reality shows yeah. trying to happen. Yeah, major, that would not have major, happened yeah, major production companies, major networks that are interested in telling the story and how we can. That normally, if I went to them and wanted to do something, mm -hmm. they would have no. They want to promote your music. Yeah. they want right. And it's a it's an amazing thing when you know I live by Romans eight twenty eight. All things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that every single thing in your life that happens is a good thing. What it means is that God will take that thing, even the thing that you called negative, and make it work for your good. So that being um, what some people would perceive as a negative transition has opened up many, many, not just doors, but knocked down walls and given me a truth for my life and, and added something to my story. So I think that fire produces gold, but also when you go through the hell in your, that's here on earth, um, it produces a heaven on the other side. And it's something powerful I know for my life. It's added a story. It's added an interesting chapter um, to my book. What do you think, Robert? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us on this episode. Yes, and amen. amen. <laughs> the thing which I feared came upon me, my personal story, is um, after living in hiding for years and years and years and having a coming out experience, it my whole world was devastated. My church was gone. My family was gone for the most part. My business, my health. I had so much pain going on in that season of my life that I almost died and crack cocaine saved my life. A friend said, here, try this. 
and it, it actually kept me from killing myself because wow. suddenly mm -hmm. nothing else mattered. Mm -hmm. So I only smoked crack once, but it was for like a year. <laughs> 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 and, I, and I don't recommend it. I'm saying anyway, you know, I don't recommend no. it at all. But it was a season that I had to go through, and it was in that time and that season, the worst possible thing. People found out who I was, and I was raised. Uh, that was the most horrible demonic, mm -hmm. ugly, perverted thing that could ever you could ever be, and I was that. How can and you call unclean what I've called clean? Thank you. And it's a, you know, call it an abomination, but it came down in the bed sheet, speaking of, <laughs> and, in the bed, and God said, don't call unclean what I've called clean. So he called me clean, and for me to realize it, it took that season, I had no real compassion for people until I became a homeless crackhead, you know, and found myself. See, I believe eventually, Whatever you believe is true is true. All the conspiracy yeah. theories. Um, I had my Armageddon. I walked through the streets wow. looking mm -hmm. through garbage cans. Mm -hmm. uh, picked up a piece of chicken. You had your tribulation period. I did. I spun my, the piece of chicken around where the guy had left one bite and eaten the other side because I was hungry. And I ate that chicken. Do you think I would have done that a few years before that? Mm -hmm. It brought me to a place. I quit joking about homeless crackheads. They, they weren't funny anymore to me because mm -hmm. my Armageddon, that was real. It's real to a homeless man yeah. that's walking, you know, wishing he had a piece of bread. Wow. It became real to me, and at the same time, it made me real. And for, for the first time in my life, I embraced and was okay with who I was, and it never left. The call of God never left. Right. People ask me, what's the greatest worship service you've ever been in? The second greatest worship service I've ever been in was at your church. Church in the now, I can't remember the day, but just being there with the worship, and it was just an amazing, but the first was at a crack hotel on Fulton Industrial Boulevard, in an old room where the ceiling was falling down, where a crack whore had gone and done a trick for a truck driver, swapped the trick for a keyboard that was battery powered and brought it back to me and said, I knew you played the piano, do you want to play? Jesus. So I put it in an old banquet room where the ceiling was falling and with a few little crack whores and a couple of dealers and the lady that ran the motel standing around, we sang Amazing Grace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as we sang it, it looked around and everybody's crying and I realized, you know what? God's as real, if not more real, than he's ever been to me right here, right now in this worship service. We all realize that in spite of what society would say yeah. about us, we were valuable. We were part of an apple. We all had a root that was worth. So, yeah, my worst time brought me to my very best time, and that was to be authentic. I, I just felt them right now when you said that story. That's, I don't well, want well, to take up anybody's time, but, yeah, you know, in, in Matthew 25, when Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me, or I was naked and you clothed me, and he said those that were divided and went into the fire, he wasn't talking about a place of eternal punishment. He was saying, if you are indifferent to suffering disenfranchised people, then something is Thank going you. to happen to you that is going to burn out right. that kind of pride to where you'll be able to say... No, I, I know what it's like. When, yeah. when did we see you hungry? Well, when you wow. fed the person. It's not a mechanical thing of I'm going into a homeless ministry or something right. like that. It's it's just the way life is. Mm -hmm. And and there are certain things that happen to you that force you to be empathetic that would have never yeah. never crossed your mind yeah. otherwise. I went to hell. I went to head on again. Right. right. Hell I, is real. It's real. Yeah. It's here. But it's, it's not a place of eternal punishment that God right, sent you exactly. to India. I had a Absolutely. rapture, but I was left behind. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, that's that ultimate paradigm shift of truth is you realize what I was taught, a phrase I was taught that I had to learn to realize in that moment, you realize what you do is not who you are. But understanding who you are will change everything that you do. And a pastor, somebody I, I feel like as a pastor to me said recently, I'm going through some hard times now. And not flippantly here, but I've heard it flippantly elsewhere. Glory to glory. And the pastor said, those two letters, T-O, the two from yeah. glory to glory, are full of crap. Yeah. And it's the hardest, lowest thing you'll go through. And if you want to take that outside of the church and you look at Jim Henson, you look at Oprah Winfrey, you look at Steve Jobs, they had glory, all of them. And at some point in their life, be it young, it right. came up or had it and lost it, they went to and then they ended it's a terrifying glory. process. It's and, it's really what yeah, John was talking, what Jesus was talking about in John three. You must be born again. But birth is okay. it's a beautiful thing, but it's a traumatic sure. thing. I mean, birth is bloody and messy and mm -hmm. gross and hurts and babies die and but but it's a necessary process. It and, shows you who and you it's are. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. Rebecca, what say you? I think um, 
I think we don't like the idea of it's the worst of times because so much in our culture we're inundated with uh, these idols of like consumerism or materialism and we don't like suffering even though it's all throughout the biblical narrative so even you know Job suffered right and it says many are the afflictions of the righteous but we do not like suffering it says in the New Testament if you follow Christ you're promised to suffer but we don't like that I mean suffering doesn't sell it's not popular it's not great even Job's friends were like, dude, you must be screwing up. You must be mm -hmm. sinning. Why are you going through all this? Mm -hmm. You know, what have right. you done? You should have did this. You should have right. did that. You should have, should have, should have. And they should all over the guy. I mean, <laughs> I don't like being should on. I don't know about you yeah. guys, but people should on us when we're going through suffering. Mm -hmm. Yet, all throughout scripture, it says many are the afflictions of the righteous and you are promised to suffering. To but suffer. the Lord delivers him from the yeah. Lord delivers and suffering, him. And suffering produces perseverance. Like perseverance killing. produces character. So, yes. character produces so where hope. where do we get this as Christians? If we're not sinning, if we're loving God, we are prosperous because right. the first you can't time, support it from the Bible. No, no. And I was confused. I'll go ahead and say that it was on me. I, I didn't know where I was. Where I was in my loss period, and the first time I ever experienced you was at a Christmas banquet. At the end of it, you said, you shall go forth and be prosperous. And I could not connect with that mm -hmm. because I'm suffering. And now mm -hmm. here at this table, we're all talking about if you follow the Lord, you're bound to suffering. But mm -hmm. then, of course, you do get glory. Where do we get that concept of if we follow God, we're prosperous? It, so that <clears throat> it depends on where you are in the story. You know, like jo jo um, Joseph has these amazing dreams, and then the exact opposite happens in his life. And if you had found him during any of those subsequent years, you would have said, well, Job, clearly you, your dream was a lie. Mm -hmm. So it depends on where you are. Yes, Same way. in the world you will have tribulation, comma, but be of good cheer, I've overcome right. the world. Right. And I think when we hear, I over, have overcome the world, we don't really hear what he's actually saying. It was a, if, if you saw Jesus dying on the cross, you would think, well, you, did you not pay your tithes? Do, right. There, yeah. I mean, what, what's going on? Why are you? Why well, like are you I said, you know, when like Paul's that? saying, I rejoice in my <coughs> sufferings because it right. produces ultimately hope. And when you think about it, if I have a flat tire, that's, you know, <coughs> it might be a small suffering, but for that day, you're like, ah, I'm flat tire. But for the mechanic who's going to fix your tire or the guy that sells tires and you're going to pay, that, that might be his blessing that day. You know, maybe today is his day. And so I think sometimes we get selfish and we get self centered and we think that we're the only ones that should be gaining but through our suffering perhaps others uh, gain others others prosper and sometimes we go through a, we go through that process and it's necessary David yeah. how do you relate to this well just telling that story I, I, I just saw the picture of the garden and, mm -hmm. and there's the worm having a great day and, and I'm cultivating and here comes the robin mm -hmm. one of them's getting prosperous right right and one of them's yeah. not blessing the day <laughs> as much right but they're both real Right. right, and they're both necessary. Both necessary. Yeah. Eddie, um, you you need a grace period after you go through something, in order to appreciate that you went through it. Mm -hmm. In the moment, it seems the most horrible place you could ever be. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, I could talk about HIV, but I remember the first house I had ever bought, I was 19 years old. <clears throat> and I had a, the mind of a 19-year-old, um, had a one-year-old little girl, 18-year-old wife, and we had bought a house in Austell, Georgia, and, it, and we had paid on it for like three years, and every year the mortgage went up, but my pay didn't go up. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those kind of things. So I, remem I remember... Um, you know, it was being repossessed, and we got out. They, 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 we kept trying to write it out to save what little bit of money we was moved. We moved back to Cabbage Town, rented a little place for like forty bucks a month. But uh, the day they put the notice on the door, saying the sheriff's was going to show up the next day to set our stuff on the street, <clears throat> and so we moved at night time because we didn't know what time the next day. We was loading up the truck and mm -hmm. got a couple of guys to help me. But I felt so horrible, like, my God, you know, this is the American dream. You know, and a lot of people have went through that in the last five mm -hmm. or six years. And I remember when I got my last load that I told Kathy, my wife, I said, uh, wait a minute, the house was empty. and. I've, um, I've always loved God, so I didn't want nobody to see what I did, but I said, wait a minute, let me just go check everything. 
but I walked back in the house and it was dark and um, I went in every room and I laid my hands on every wall mm -hmm. and I thank God that he let me live there for three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought I would never own a home again in my life. You know, a 19 year old boy. And the, I mean, the, the moment was powerful for me and even 40 years later, yeah. it brings right. up yeah. a raw emotion. I thought I would never own another house. My credit was going to be ruined. I was married with a little kid. I wasn't making no money. Four, three or four years ago, a lady came into my shop and she wanted me to make her a sign that said move and sale. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm a chatter. I like to talk with people. And she was 35 or 40, an African-American lady. And I'm like, uh, so you're moving out of the neighborhood? She said, no, I'm losing my home. I've lost my job. Mm -hmm. And just broke down and started weeping. She took me back to that 19-year-old boy. And I spent about 30 minutes telling her, you will have another place that will be better. And not to be boastful, although it could appear that way, I told her, I said, come here, I want to show you something. I shared with her the story that I just shared with her, and I wept with her because she was weeping. She said, my wife can just, I'm already almost 40, how did I have my, my house? And I showed her on the wall, I said, there's maybe 20 sets of keys right there. I've been where you've been but I've owned 40, 50 places of that still own properties that's all around the city now. But I too thought I would never own another place. How did it change me? I live in a small house in East Point now. I've lived in big houses. I, it made me appreciate what I do have. Mm -hmm. Even if I stopped yeah. at the Waffle House before, because I got here a little early, I got me a sausage and egg sandwich. No, I didn't say grace over it. I don't do all that <laughs> after stuff. But I'm appreciative that I can digest and enjoy a sausage and egg sandwich. Some people can't eat it. Yeah. I'm appreciative. So I, I've got multiple things I could share. But believe me, we learn much more by those experiences than by scratching off and winning seven thousand dollars on the lottery. Yeah, right. yeah. You know? yeah that's good stuff. And your ladder was greater than your former. I mean, you yeah. own yeah. buy and sell property now, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, when, when you lose, when you lose something like that, um, it affects so much of your. You feel like such a failure. Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I have to drive by forty-three acres over here that I lost, and mm -hmm. you know that was my entire life's dream, and. Uh, I go past it now and don't even look at it because it's just too, I, I don't want to relive it anymore. I still look at it. But it I'm uh, like, why didn't I know Bishop Jim when he was there? When I, when I was somebody. But um, I, I remember going through a, a phase where I, th I thought, well, who am I now? Because I'm so used to being introduced as, oh, you're that guy that has the big church on I-20 with the big sign. Mm -hmm. I, I had been that for so many years that I had to learn a whole new way to introduce myself because so much of uh, my identity, you know, Robert lost an entire, what do you call that, a complex that you had built over there. Like, it's like a whole city nearly that you built. And we, you know, we've had to redefine who we are. Is there life after it? We've got so much more to talk about, so I'm just going to put a, a comma right there. So don't, um, just stay right in this mood because I want to, I want to capture this again. Uh, thanks for joining us on In the Now with Jim Swilly. We'll be back. See you soon.